Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video, we'll be covering all training methods that can contribute to speed development, and how these can be incorporated into a training program. Let's first establish what training methods can be beneficial for sprint performance, and why these methods are useful. The first and most important training method for speed development is unloaded sprinting. Unloaded sprint training refers to sprinting in a straight line with maximal effort. This is the most specific form of training that an athlete can use and will always be the most important training method. All other training methods can be implemented, but if unloaded sprinting isn't performed, the athlete simply won't get faster. The second most specific method of developing speed is resisted sprint training. Resisted sprint training refers to sprinting against some form of external load. This includes exercises such as sled pulls, hill sprints, parachute sprints and other exercises which reduce sprint speed. Resisted sprints should also be performed with maximal effort at all times for maximal transfer to sprint performance. Resisted sprint training generally has the highest transfer to acceleration ability since ground contact times are longer and force output is higher during the first 10 meters of sprinting. The next training method that can enhance sprint performance is plyometric training. Plyometric training refers to exercises that have a high reliance on the stretch shortening cycle. Plyometric training can improve the efficiency of the stretch shortening cycle, allowing each ground contact to store and release more elastic energy. This training method generally has the highest transfer to maximum velocity sprinting, as this is where the fastest stretch shortening cycles occur. Another training method that can enhance sprint performance is power training. This refers to moving external loads using ballistic exercises, or in other words, exercises which have no deceleration phase. This includes exercises like jumping and throwing, Power training trains the ability to produce high forces in short time frames. This generally has the highest transfer to acceleration ability because strides during the acceleration phase are performed with ballistic muscle actions and force must be produced concentrically in short time frames. The next training method that can enhance sprint performance is maximal strength. Maximal strength refers to training to improve absolute force production. By improving maximal force output, more force can be produced with each stride. And the last training method that can enhance sprint performance is general strength. General strength training refers to full body weight training with moderate loads and moderate rep ranges. While general strength training isn't a very specific form of training, it can still indirectly contribute to sprint performance by providing structural adaptations and reducing the risk of injury. Now that we have established what training methods can be beneficial to enhance sprint performance, let's now explore how these methods can be periodized. When periodizing training, we want to implement more general training methods further from when we need to perform at our peak, and more specific training methods closer to when we need to peak. This allows the athlete to build foundational physical qualities using general training, and then have maximal transfer to sprint performance by using the most specific training methods. For unloaded sprint training, we can periodize training by starting with shorter distances and gradually progress to longer distances. Shorter distances will limit sprint speed and will emphasize the acceleration portion of the sprint, while longer distances will allow faster speeds to be reached. By progressing unloaded sprint training in this way, it allows the athlete to slowly adapt to the stress of high velocity sprinting. Resisted sprint training can be periodized by starting with higher resistance and shorter distances and gradually progress to lower resistance with longer distances. Shorter distances with heavier loads will require higher force production but will limit sprint speed. Longer distances with lighter loads will allow faster running speeds. Plyometric training can be periodized by starting with exercises that involve longer ground contact times and gradually progress to exercises that involve faster ground contact times. Longer contact times involve higher forces, while shorter contact times involve a faster stretch shortening cycle. Since sprinting involves very short contact times, fast plyometrics will have the highest transfer to performance. Power training can be periodized by starting with heavier loads 
and gradually progress to lighter loads. Heavier loads will involve higher force production and slower movement speed, while lighter loads will involve force to be produced in faster times. Fast velocity power training is more specific to sprint performance since force is required to be produced in short timeframes. Maximal strength training can be periodized by starting with lighter loads and higher rep ranges and gradually progress to heavier loads with lower rep ranges. Lighter loads with higher rep ranges are best for hypertrophy adaptations, while heavier loads are best for training force output. Heavier loads will have more transfer to sprint performance, since force is ultimately what allows explosive movements. General strength training doesn't need to be periodized, as we always want to use moderate loads with moderate rep ranges. However, progressive overload should still be applied over time. With these periodization principles in mind, Let's now create a speed-based training program. Let's create a 15-week program to peak an athlete's sprint speed. It should be noted that this is not specific to track events like the 100 and 200 meter sprints. It is a general speed training program for any athlete who wants to become faster. First, let's establish a basic program structure. So the 15-week program can be split into three mesocycles of five weeks. Each of these mesocycles will include one deload week, where volume will be reduced, then four overloading weeks of training. This athlete will include four training sessions per week, with two sessions being performed on a track or open field, and two sessions being performed in the gym. The track or field sessions will include unloaded sprint training, resisted sprint training, and plyometric methods, while the gym sessions will include power, maximal strength, and general strength training. In the first mesocycle, the most general training methods will be implemented as we are furthest from when the athlete aims to peak. An example mesocycle may look something like this. As we can see here, sprint training uses shorter distances for the first mesocycle. The distances gradually increase each week over the mesocycle to slowly expose the athlete to faster running speeds. We can also see here that day 1 and 3 undulate by using slightly different distances. For resisted sprint training, the sled pull has been chosen as an exercise using heavy to moderate loads. Once again, the loads undulate between the two sessions to pair up with the unloaded sprints. The distances increase over the mesocycle in the same way as the unloaded sprint training. For plyometric training, two exercises have been implemented for each session. Bounds have been chosen as a primarily horizontally oriented exercise, while repeated vertical jumps have been chosen as a vertically oriented exercise. Both exercises use an additional load of 10 kilos to increase ground contact times and increase force demand. The reps increase each week as a form of progression. For power training, the squat jump has been implemented using heavy to moderate loads. The loads are undulated between sessions for slightly more of a force emphasis on day 4 and more of a velocity emphasis on day 2. Reps increase each week as a form of progression. For maximal strength training, the trap bar deadlift has been selected as a primary lift. The trap bar deadlift uses higher rep ranges in this mesocycle to emphasize hypertrophy adaptations. Once again, this undulates between sessions to pair up with the power exercise. For the general strength exercises, the bench press, stiff leg deadlift, dumbbell overhead press, and bent over row have been implemented to target the muscle groups that aren't emphasized with other training methods. A rep range of 12 to 15 has been chosen for day 2, and a slightly heavier rep range of 8 to 12 has been implemented for day 4. For the second mesocycle, more specific training methods have been employed, but not the most specific. This is because we don't aim to have the athlete in absolute peak condition just yet. For unloaded sprint training, the distances have increased further from the previous block, allowing the athlete to reach faster speeds. The sled pull uses lighter loads for each session, and the distances have also slightly increased, again to allow faster running speeds. The plyometric exercises are the same as the previous block, although the load has decreased to 5 kilos, and the number of reps performed have also increased. For power training, the squat jump has remained as the exercise, while the load has decreased, allowing faster movement velocities. For the trap bar deadlift, 
the rep ranges have been reduced, allowing heavier loads to be used. And for the general strength exercises, all variables remain the same. For the third and final mesocycle, the most specific training methods have been implemented. This is to have the highest transfer to sprint performance since the athlete aims to be in absolute peak sprint condition at this time of the year. For unloaded sprint training, the distances increase even further up to a maximum of 65 meters, which will allow the faster sprinting speeds to be reached. The sled pull has reduced in load once again, and the distances have increased once again to allow faster running speeds. The plyometric exercises are all unloaded to allow the shortest ground contact times. The repeated vertical jumps have been replaced with pogo hops, as this exercise requires even shorter ground contact times. The squat jump now uses very light loads, allowing movement velocity to be maximal. The trap bar deadlift uses lower rep ranges to allow maximum loads to be lifted, and the general strength exercises remain the same once again. Thanks for watching, and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.